In recent years, decentralized, leaderless uprisings have erupted around the globe with increasing frequency. Battered by the interlocking crises of climate change, entrenched poverty, and state violence, billions of us have seen our security and living standards deteriorate. This has produced a deep reservoir of rage and spurred millions of people into action. Yet despite massive mobilizations and countless acts of individual and collective courage, these uprisings have fallen short. Whether crushed by the jackboot of state power, demobilized by promises of reform, or some combination of both, they have failed to achieve the lofty goals of revolution. Each of these seemingly spontaneous uprisings began as localized protests against corruption, the cost of living, or the impunity of police and state officials. Then, for whatever reason, they touched a nerve. More people joined in, leading to louder and louder calls for reform. In some cases, the uprising escalated beyond the realm of protest, transforming into moments of insurrectionary possibility that shook the authority and legitimacy of the state itself. These brief windows of revolutionary potential are referred to, by some, as moments of dual power. So what exactly is dual power? And why is it an important concept for anarchists to be aware of? The term dual power was coined by Vladimir Lenin to describe the tense political dynamic that reigned in Russia in the wake of the February Revolution of 1917. Following the overthrow of the Romanov dynasty, power was effectively split between the Provisional Government and the Soviet of Workers and Soldiers Deputies in Petrograd, or modern-day St. Petersburg. The Bolsheviks saw an opportunity and exploited it ruthlessly. In September, they assumed control of the Petrograd Soviet, and in October, they used it as a vehicle to capture state power. Once in control, they moved swiftly to consolidate their rule, imprisoning and executing their political rivals, including many anarchists, and burying the power of the Soviets under the sprawling bureaucracy of a totalitarian state. Given this history, many anarchists understandably avoid the baggage associated with the term dual power. Some see any use of the phrase as evidence of a hidden Leninist plot. Others prefer to talk about counterpower and moments of rupture instead. But using a different word doesn't change the phenomenon being described. And ignoring the lessons of history only dooms our movements to repeat them, leaving future uprisings to falter at key moments or to be co-opted by a new generation of authoritarian reactionaries. In its broadest sense, dual power describes a situation where two or more competing political frameworks exist in the same territory at the same time. It implies a high level of popular mobilization, in which large numbers of people participate in alternative institutions set up outside and against those of the state. Situations of dual power are inherently unstable. If the state is unable to maintain and reassert its monopoly on the legitimate use of force, a crisis can trigger a revolution, a coup d'etat, foreign military occupation, or even a civil war. In some cases, the result may be a protracted insurgency or a political stalemate in which armed groups manage to carve out pockets of autonomy, such as the Zapatistas have done in Chiapas. It's worth stressing that dual power does not necessarily imply a strategy to seize state power. The negating force can also assume the form of destituent power, a movement that seeks the destruction of the state and the dissolution of its ruling institutions. Anarchists in Spain were presented with just such an opportunity on July 20th, 1936. After beating back Franco's attempted coup d'etat in Barcelona, leaders from the CNT and FAI were invited to a meeting with the president of the semi-autonomous Catalonia region, Luis Companies. Acknowledging that the anarchists had saved the city and were effectively in control, Companies offered his resignation. But the anarchists hadn't planned for this eventuality. Rather than dissolving the state, they opted to leave the Republican government in place and entered into an anti-fascist military pact. Just four months later, two prominent anarchists, Garcia Oliver and Federica Montseny, accepted ministerial positions within the reconstituted Spanish state 
In the name of anti-fascist unity, they joined a government that proceeded to dissolve autonomous worker and peasant collectives, disarm anarchist militias, reinstate the police, and smother the revolution, thereby paving the way to fascist victory. These days, earnest discussions about revolution and dual power can seem delusional, given the low levels of working class self-organization and the sophisticated arsenal of surveillance and repression that the state can bring to bear against social movements. But alongside an awareness of the operation of recuperation and repression, an understanding of dual power is important for navigating the pitfalls of state power, rekindling our revolutionary imagination and orienting our strategies towards freedom and autonomy. In the so-called United States, anarchist perspectives on dual power have grown out of contributions made by members of the Love and Rage Anarchist Federation and influential black anarchist theorist Lorenzo Camboa Irvin. In recent years, the concept has been picked up and promoted by anarchist communist organizations like Black Rose and even the Libertarian Socialist Caucus of the DSA. As discussions of dual power have become more widespread, its definition has been stretched to include organizing or participating in tenant and labor unions, co-ops, countercultural institutions such as info shops, music venues, social centers, and Food Not Bombs chapters. These projects can play an important role in reproducing radical social movements and providing a material basis for solidarity. But to frame these isolated initiatives as part of a coherent strategy of building dual power, puts the cart before the horse and risks promoting the populist idea that capitalism and the state can be overcome through a process of prefigurative nonviolence. Organizing, engaging in class struggle and building or strengthening networks of community autonomy and mutual aid are all worthwhile activities in their own right. That said, within the so-called United States, a situation of dual power is more likely to emerge as part of a process of political disintegration and civil war. These were the political conditions under which Syrian anarchist Omar Aziz, in the heady early days of the Syrian revolution, issued his call for the formation of local councils, defended by local militias, aligned to the Free Syrian Army. Three years after his death in an Assadist jail cell, Nearly 400 local councils were set up across the country, coordinating the revolutionary activities and daily survival of millions of people in areas liberated from the Ba'athist regime. These are also the conditions faced by the Revolutionary Committee of Sudan, a network of hundreds of affinity groups that organized and led the protest that toppled Omar al-Bashir's regime in 2019. Following the outbreak of a brutal civil war in 2023, its activists were forced to assume the coordination of many of the humanitarian and logistical services previously handled by the war-wracked Sudanese state. At the time of writing, many of these revolutionaries have been forced into hiding or exile, and the country stands on the brink of a horrific famine. This is not to say that the principles of dual power are only relevant in periods of civil war or counter-revolution. They also apply to the internal conflicts found in many indigenous nations and communities across the lands ruled by the Canadian state. Struggles that often pit the supporters of an elected banned council system, empowered by the Federal Indian Act, and backed by the money of extractive industries, against supporters of traditional systems of indigenous self-governance who reject the authority of laws imposed on them by their colonial occupiers. And they apply to smaller experiments in autonomy from the occupation in Tahrir Square in Egypt and the Pearl Roundabout in Bahrain, to the ZAD of Notre Dame de Landes, to the popular assemblies of Oaxaca, and Tea dos Povos, or Web of People in so-called Brazil. Dual power is an essential phase in the struggle for collective liberation. It's also fraught with risks. Power is material, and revolution is a zero-sum game. Those who seek to build a new world in the shell of the old must be prepared to fight for it, and ultimately, to destroy the old world in the process.